Welcome back to Live With, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit speciesnutrition.com. I'm Dave Palumbo, and today's guest is, once again, flashback to the 90s, one of the big stars up and coming around the time of Dorian Yates, uh, one of the biggest guys out there. He was in all the magazines, and uh, he's a good, uh, he was a friend to me, kind of indirectly, but we have an interesting story about how we met. Ian Harrison, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Ian, where have you been? Can you believe the 90s are, are gone 25 years ago? I know it's crazy. I, I used to be young and now I'm old and I missed the middle bit somewhere along the line. <laughs> you know, how old are you now? You, you, what, you got to be about my age, right? 50? I just turned 50 a few days ago, yeah. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. I'm actually older than you, so so there. <laughs> Ian. Yeah. Uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. Um, yeah, I, um, I retired in 1998. Uh, my pro career was quite short, uh, which I can explain why in a bit. But uh, after I re uh, left bodybuilding in 98, I started pro wrestling. Um, I moved to the US in 2001, but throughout all that time, once I quit in 98, I honestly didn't even pick up a bodybuilding magazine. It was hard to leave the sport. You know, when you're so involved in it, it's hard to leave a sport. Sure, so sure. That, that's kind of why I disappeared because um, I, it was like watching your own birthday party and not being there. <laughs> <laughs> you were one of the brightest stars in, in Britain back in the, uh, in the in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, I remember Chris Aceto and I were talking about you on the radio this past Monday. And he was saying that he saw you, I think he won the, was it the junior something, a junior NABBA universe, something like that. And, he said, you I won the junior Mr. Britain and the junior Mr. Universe in uh, 1988. Yeah. And, uh, and that was the same year Dorian won the British and turned pro. Uh, so I decided while I was still a junior uh, to switch federations from NABBA to EFBB um, and go after that title. And uh, my, my first try while I was still a junior at 20, I, uh, I won the heavyweight and, and the overall and uh, got the, my, my pro card at 20. Which is which is unheard of, especially in, in usually in the UK. I mean, you guys only have like one or two pro qualifiers a year, and for you to do it at such a young age, I mean, people were talking about you being, you know, possibly the next Dorian Yates, the next Mr. Olympia. Um, give us the, the the I guess the timeline. Once you won that uh, British Championships and got your pro card, what happened after that? At that point, I uh, I realized I was still very young. I had a lot of muscle maturity to add, so I uh, I left my full time job. I used to work um, for the electricity board, digging up roads and laying underground cables, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, right to turning pro. Uh, so I left that, set up my own gym, and I ran that for about three years, and then I started competing as a pro. I think my first pro show was 93. Uh, I tried to do the Night of the Champions with my pro debut originally, and I overdiet. I, well, I, I, I dehydrated badly. Um, I had a bad experience, didn't get on stage. And then my first actual uh, time on stage was the English Grand Prix uh, later that year. I was kind of, my arm was twisted. I kind of told I had to do it. Yeah. And then uh, 94, I believe, I did the Night of the Champions Chicago Pro. And then my best year was 95, uh, the Olympia in 95. Now, how did, how did you wait so long? I mean, you really, I mean, you turned pro, I think it was in 89, and then you really didn't do your pro debut. You waited four years to do a pro debut. What were you doing during that whole time period? Uh, setting up a gym, setting up my business. Okay. Uh, that took me about. That took about a year out. Uh, and then I realized I needed to add a lot of muscle to compete at that level. I mean, the standard back then was phenomenal. Uh, so I, I just realized I needed to train my backside off and eat like a horse and sleep like a champion. And I would, I would gain the muscle I needed to do. And that's, that's what I basically did for three straight years before I stepped on stage. And that was a very mature move. A lot of guys would have wanted to jump right in there and, and, and see what they could do as a pro because, I mean, you had to be excited about being a pro. I mean, obviously, it was, it was, back then, it was, it was a real accolade to get a pro card. They, they didn't hand them out, you know, like uh, M&Ms. You know, you had to no, really it, earn it. It was one, one, one man and one woman a year got it out of England. Uh, like I say, I, I saw Dorian win it the year before me. And uh, that kind of, honestly, up to that point in England, Dave, NABBA had the freakier physiques. Mm. Um, you know, EFBB were, weren't really, the standard work wasn't, it, what, they weren't gnarly looking. They weren't beefy, thick, ripped bodybuilders. And when Dorian came along, that kind of changed. So I switched federations. So did a few other guys. Eddie Elwood switched federations. Yeah. And uh, I was lucky enough to walk away with my pro card. But I wasn't naive enough to think I was good enough to actually be competitive. 
So that's why I took the time off to add, add the muscle I felt I needed. Were, were people comparing you and Dorian at that point? Was there, was there people saying, you know, like ri creating rivalries there already? Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. You, you're in the same country. You've got people that um, like him or like me or whatever. I was younger. Uh, you know, I, I, I had a lot. Of, I had good genetics. I had good potential. I just, um, I, I, had, I, had a, I was younger. I had a younger look. I didn't have sure. the same maturity. So, t um, you know, I think... Um, I don't know. I, I got the muscle maturity towards the end of my career, but by then I was kind of, uh, I, I had enough, to be honest with you. Yeah, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But when when Dorian was coming up, you know, obviously he was doing the more of the, the low uh, volume kind of training, very heavy weights. You know, what was the, uh, I guess, what were people doing in England? Were they following suit or were, were they still in the old, you know, 80s style of, you know, high repetition, you know, a higher volume type, type of training? There was there's a lot there was a lot of good bodybuilders in England back then. You know, I mean, I you, I saw you had a Sean Davis on the other day. Yeah. You know I mean, I, I I was like the year behind Sean as a junior, and there was a lot of like really like almost. Uh, but the thought there were doctors, but there weren't, and uh, we all get in rooms and, and come up with all ideas of how to get bigger and uh, how to grow, and um, it just it, it was a very competitive atmosphere. You know what I mean? There, there was a lot of good athletes there. It was a very, very competitive atmosphere. Yeah. What did What did you feel was um, you know your your Did you think you were going to be Mister Olympia? Back then, I did. Yeah, because yeah. I was I was I was, <laughs> I was I was I was very I was full of it. You know, I I believed I had the potential, and uh, I was willing to work as hard as anybody. Um, we, we all trained. I didn't answer your question, but we all we all trained very hard and very heavy. Um, we all kind of adapted to different, maybe not exactly how Dorian did it or not exactly how Mike Mensa did it. Yeah. But I did low sets. I did a lot of drop sets, a lot of forced reps. Mm. Uh, and I, I was known for training hard and heavy, and I got, I got strong because of it. Um, but, it, yeah, it's, um, it, the, 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 work, the work ethic back then was different, I think. You out-trained and out-ate your rivals. Um, yeah. <laughs> <you know? laughs> training, I always said it. You know, I talked to Dorian about this. The training was, was the most important thing back then in eating, you know, whereas today I think it's more drug related. What, you know, I asked Dorian, I asked um, um, Sean as well, I'm gonna ask you the same question. What were the, what were the drug cycles that you guys were using back then, that, at least that you personally were using, you know, to, to put on the most size, do you think? What was the dosages and the kind of drugs that you guys were using? I, know, I, I actually uh, came up with a system that a lot of people didn't actually believe what I did when I went to seminars and, um, I had a few guys that ridiculed me for the way I did it, but I, I was always, it always kind of scared me, to be honest with you. Um, I, 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 that's part of the reason why I retired so young. But I always did six weeks, uh, six week cycles. Um, really? I'd do, my, my first two weeks were androgen loaded. I'd always androgen load heavy for the first two weeks, usually with Sustan on, Decker. Mm -hmm. And then I would switch to fast acting, uh, I'd, I'd, or faster acting. I would normally go, propionate was one of my favorites. Um, I'd use propionate, maybe some tren, um, and maybe some orals all the way through, like anadrol or a D ball. And then I would do three to four weeks off, and then I'd repeat. So it was six week on, three week off, six week on, three week off, mm. and it worked for me. I never really had to change it very much, right? Did you... Unless I was competing, and then it was it, it ended up being like twelve week on, because you do your normal six week cycle, and then I'd, I'd do everything changed for me about four weeks out. That's when I changed everything. Did, but, did you uh, feel? I, I never really had a guru. I, I was actually listening to you, you, you and Chris talk on that radio show. <laughs> oh, you he did. Said, uh, he said that I, I asking me if he were, if he felt like he was over dieted his whole career. I had, I do. I agree with him completely. Oh, you I did. Okay, always, I, was I always ask wanted you that. to work with Chris. I always wanted to work with him, but I, ne I was never in the loop, Dave. I never knew people. Right. You know, so I never, I never got the chance to work with anybody. I would love to have done. I would love to have seen where I, my potential could have taken me, because. Uh, I retired at 28. Now, we yeah, tell us the story. So you, you 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 decided at some point, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. That's a big decision for a guy who's had the, the amount of mass you had on you. I mean, you were in Flex Magazine. I remember seeing a lot of the photo shoots they did of you. I, re I remember that one shoot where they had you had they had this like like suspenders or they were like over yeah. you know your shoulder and that it's was like the, me and NASA yeah 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 you and NASA I mean it was a great that was an awesome photo shoot what made you say hey I had enough and that was it was it health related was it just mental related what, what was it 
I honestly, Dave, I mean, you were you were competing at that time. You knew what the scene was like. Yeah. It got to the point when I was... I, I, I think that the, the, the breakthrough for me was the Olympia in 95. I actually mm. competed in the best condition I'd ever been in in that right. show. You were. I was, 200, I was 279 pounds on stage. Um, and I knew I could compare with a lot of those guys. But that lineup was strong. I mean, I think Ronnie got 10th that year. Yeah. Charles Clement got joint tenth with Ronnie. It was a it was a great lineup, but because I didn't get a call out, because I didn't get compared at all, I'm not even a lucky. And it kind of, I felt like it didn't matter what you looked like. It made no difference. It was a name game. It was politics. That's that's how I felt back then. And um, I had a year off after that, and then I came back uh, in '97, and then '98. Um, my my wife. I had I had a I was married by this time. I had a baby girl, um, mm-hmm. and in '98. My wife just broke down actually at the at the airport and said I can't do this anymore. Uh, so I just said okay, if I don't place in the top five because the top five qualified for the Olympia, if I don't place in the top five, I retire. Um, and I'm not sure where I placed, but it wasn't in the top five. Nice. So I, I kept my word and I, I retired because I felt like my health wasn't worth. I, I felt like I could do anything and everything and come in bigger and bigger and better and better. And it really didn't make any difference to where I was going to place. That's how I felt all the time. When when you look back over, like, you know, what happened over the next couple of years, Dorian retired, Ronnie came on the scene, Jay kind of came up, and, and the physiques kind of changed a little bit. Um, do you say to yourself, man, I wonder how I could have done if I would have stuck it out another couple of years? Yeah, many a time. Many a time. Um, especially, I mean... I, Oh, me and Ronnie used to play very similar at a lot of shows. I travelled a lot with Ronnie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got some funny stories to tell you about Ronnie, actually, because, you know, <laughs> it, and then I always looked at the history of bodybuilding. Right. Um, and you, you remember, like, Lee Haney, Dorian, the, with their first year coming in as a pro, they usually either won their pro debut or got second and, and created a buzz. And uh, by the, the first Olympia, they placed very high, and by the second time they did the Olympia, they won it. And that was kind of the history of bodybuilding. And right. uh, I, I almost felt like by the time I'd got to 1998, which was nearly five years competing as a pro, and I wasn't placing any higher than when I first started, even though I was a lot bigger, I just felt like I wanted in the right place at the right time and, take, you know, call it a day and you, walk away. You were and, still uh, so young, though, too. You were 28. Yes, I was. I was. But you know what? I think that saved me. Yeah, I think, I, you know, look at look at all the people that I competed with. Yeah. Pete, you know, NASA, sure. Paul DeMeo, all, 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 I've been in rooms with guys, seven or eight guys, I'm the only one still alive. Yeah, there's, there's some kind of survival mechanism inside of you said, hey, I better get out of here because this yeah. arms race might kill me. So it was probably, <laughs> a, in, in hindsight, a, probably a good decision. Talk to me a little bit about, you said you mentioned some Ronnie Coleman stories. Talk to me about some of the Ronnie Coleman stories that you have from uh, back in the day. We travelled a lot together, doing a lot of the shows, the San Jose, and uh, I, I, well, after the Olympic Night Five, we, we did the Grand Prix tour. Actually, I don't think Ronnie did that Grand Prix tour, uh, but the uh, two Arnold Classics that I competed against him in. One morning, I was in the the steam room at like 5 a.m. and um, I'm there for about an hour trying to dry out. Uh-huh. And uh, lo and behold, Ronnie walk, Ronnie up, you know, the door opens, Ronnie walks in, and me and him are sitting there for about an hour and a half. Just trying to wait about the show. Half? Oh my god! Yeah, it was. It was. It was so. It just so laid back. He was so such a nice guy, you know. Just a <laughs> super nice guy. He had no edge on him because a lot of us were very competitive. You know, there was sure. a lot of rivalry back yeah. then. Um, but the funniest story I think is that my last show, uh, the '98 Arnold Classic, when I decided, like I told you, I said to my wife, if I didn't place in the top five, right. I was going to retire. So the night before the show, I'm covered in proton with a long t-shirt on, laid in bed at the double tree. Um, and whoever was in the next room, I heard him come in, banging, sm- carrying on, laughing. <laughs> they must have been drunk, obviously, whoever it was. <laughs> I'm, tr- I'm, I'm trying to ignore it completely. Um, and then about five minutes into it, my wife, I guess she just had enough. Uh, she picked up a, a lamp or something from the side and started banging it on the wall. So I'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to stay calm. I don't want to stress out. I don't want my cortisol levels rising, right. so I'm just trying to stay calm. And uh, the next thing, it sounded like a leg was coming through the wall. <laughs> it, it was ridiculous. So I snapped. I just snapped like that. So I, I, go, I come out of my hotel room, and I'm banging on the next room door, banging on the door. Open this door, I'm going to kick your ass. And yeah. the guy on the other side is like, I'm going to kick your ass. 
And as he opened the door, it's Ronnie Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as soon as he saw me, he's like, Ian, I didn't realise it were you. And as soon as I realised it was Ronnie, I'm like, Ronnie, I'm sorry, I didn't realise it were you. <laughs> what and was going on in there? It was time... so loud. <laughs> that's actually the last time I've ever, I ever saw Ronnie. <laughs> no, I've never seen him since, because I've never been to a show uh, like that since. What, what was he doing in there that was so loud? I think they've just had a few drinks. Uh, Ronnie, <laughs> so a I got Ronnie had a drink. He was with know. Vicky Gates back then. I don't they remember. probably were Vicky arguing and throwing but... shit at each other. Who knows? They were probably both dieting. You're angry. I am, yeah, I know they weren't dieting. I know they weren't competing. I know that for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the last time I saw Ronnie Coleman. I don't even think. I don't even know if Ronnie remember that. That might no, be I the did. last time Ronnie and Vicky ever uh, you know, dated. Are you also? That might have been the end of the relationship for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I tell people, so I told people, you probably heard on the radio, um, I, when I got lost in, in Florida and I pulled in to, uh, to that strip club and you were working there and I asked you for directions. You remember that? Yes, I do. Well, that was, that, what year was that? 2003? I think you had only you had pretty much just moved there a year or so ago to, to, to Florida, you told me, right? That must have been. Are you sure that was Orlando? Are you sure that wasn't Tampa? Because I was work When I first moved here, I was I thought it was Orlando. It could have been personal Tampa. Personal training and working at work about doing security in a strip club. Was it Daytona jobs. or where was, where was it? I don't know. The strip club I worked in was in Brandon near Tampa. I don't know. I thought it was. I thought it was Orlando, but it could have been Tampa. It might have been Tampa. I don't remember. I used to travel so much. I don't. I. I, yeah. I got lost going somewhere, and I just pull into this random strip club, and Ian Harrison happens to be at the front door, <laughs> and I'm like, "What are you doing here?" And he's like, "What are you doing here?" I'm like, "I'm lost." And 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 you really didn't know that much either, because you had just really moved there yourself. I mean, I think you got one of the guys there to tell me where I was, where I had to go. <laughs> uh, Do you enjoy living in Florida? I absolutely love it. Yeah, I uh, I don't think, I couldn't go back and live in England. No. I love the weather. I love. We live in the country. We've got like seven acres. So nice. I'm just loving it. I'm 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 kind of gone part farmer. I've got chickens and eggs, and I got a little pond with fish in it. I'm going all organic. It's awesome. I love it. Loving I love. It. I loving did the life. same thing. I moved from New York down here. I got the same little setup. I got a couple acres here, and uh, we bought the property next to us with another few acres. We're going to put some chickens and some. Uh, my it's wife great. wants to get cows, you know, we, we want to be little farmers, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome. I love it. I want to start growing my own vegetables next, so that's next on the list. Right. What, when, um, what do you think about the current crop of bodybuilding in the IFBB? Now, when you, look, when you watch the Mr. Olympia, I don't know if you, if you check out the pictures or watch the yeah, show. Yeah, no, I do. Um, what do you think about the current group of guys, you know, starting with the whole Phil Heath era and now we're into the Sean Roden era, Phil losing, uh, the big Ramis. What, what, what What's your take on... on the eras today versus the 90s and early 2000s? Personally, I prefer, um, like, to me, the best bodybuilder I ever saw personally was Flex Wheeler, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I thought he wasn't the biggest guy, but he was the best I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the guys I see now, like Rami, very impressive, but for the size they are, they don't look as big as they should because... Mm -hmm. The, the joints are all filled in, if you know what I mean. They don't have... Yeah. I, 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 I describe it as like comparing the thing to Superman. Yeah. And, and, and I, I prefer the Superman look. That's what bodybuilding is about to me. I like, I like a tight waist. I like, um, I, I like flaring lats. I like wide shoulders. I don't, I don't think mass at all cost um, should win mm -hmm. Mr. Olympias. But that was part, another reason why I left when I did, you know, because I, I saw it going that route. I mean, Jean-Pierre Fuchs and a lot of those guys, uh, Marcus Rule, they all came in right after I, I quit. And that was, they were true mass monsters. Yeah. You know, that was the start of it all, really. That's what started, right? Yeah, but you know what? You you were as big as everyone. I mean, you were as big as Dorian. You were as big as, uh, you know, a lot of those guys that were up on the Delettes and all those guys. You could stand, you were able to stand with them mass-wise. Um, Obviously, it was it was the golden era. You know, we call it a bodybuilding when you were competing. I mean, that was the, the toughest years from that 93 to that 98, 99, right? Well, I guess when Dorian retired, even those first two years, Ronnie was there. That was like everyone was there. I mean, from the Nassers yep. and Cormiers and uh, Flex and uh, even when Mike Francois, the beginning of, of the 90s. I mean, there just was so many big guys, you know, well, around. Absolutely. Uh, I mean... Mike Francois' pro debut was the Chicago Pro, and I competed in the Chicago Pro, and I was hyped to be one of the favorites. Right. I think I, they ended up placing me sixth. 
Um, so it was like, I kept looking in the mirror, I'd phone Peter McGough up and ask him what he thought, and I'd phone other people up who valued their, their opinion, and I'd be like, am I looking in the wrong mirror? Am I, is there something <laughs> I'm missing? You know, is it, am, I, am I delusional? Am I one of those guys that really ain't that good and thinks he's that good? Yeah. So I, I second-guessed myself for a I think we uh, we lost him for a second there. You know, Ian was so big. I, I think a lot of, uh, and I'm going to ask him this when we get him back. Um, a lot of what happened to Ian, I think, was self sabotage in a sense. I think he tried to get almost too lean. You know, Chris Decido and I were talking about that too depleted. And sometimes, you know, you look better a week out from a show. And a lot of guys make mistakes, and that's why it's a good idea sometimes to have a coach so that you don't make these same errors and that you don't wind up over dieting and you know looking better a week before the show and a week after the show because if you look at the pictures that they would take of Ian in, in Flex magazine uh, some of the photo shoots were just crazy I mean he looked unbelievable and then you're like this wasn't the guy that we saw up on stage so I, I think a lot of what went on was yeah and he was young and I think that's why you know it would be it would have been interesting to see if he would have stuck around another five years you know where we would have uh, what we would have seen Ian Harrison do I think we would have seen him placing top five at the Olympia for sure um, and I, I was just talking about, you know, a, a lot of, I think, what, what went on during that era was that, you know, you, di you did a lot of second guessing of yourself, maybe because your placings weren't what you thought they were. And, and you probably over dieted a lot for shows. I think the photo shoots we would see a week after the show w wasn't representative of what we saw on, on the stage. It's like you looked yeah. better at the shoots than you did at the show itself. That, that was the mentality, though. I, I basically got told if I didn't compete, like, shredded, shredded, um, I wasn't going to win, you know. I know my pro debut, um, Kerry Case helped me uh, prepare for my Kerry, pro yeah. debut. Dorian actually came to see me in seminar, the, like, the week before my pro debut, and Dorian didn't go to see anybody in seminar. Really? <laughs> but I, I think at that time, of like, a week before the show, he said, you've got one more pound to lose. And I'm like, where from? <laughs> where, where am I going to lose it? You know, that that, that was, but th that kind of stuck with me. And I, I realized I needed to get conditioned. And then I tried, one year I did the Ironman. And um, I was training with a guy called Darren Mead. And uh, yeah, I know Darren. To me, he, he, um, him, he got my wife to put oils into my, my food. So right. I'm, my body's not responding like I thought it was. I go into the show smooth, real, real smooth. And uh, I'm free. I'm freaking out. And then they tell me after the show because they knew I wouldn't have accepted it. And they knew I wouldn't have agreed to it. Yeah. And they've been adding fats to every meal without telling me. Um, uh, it, it, but it, it, the, the intention was good. He wasn't trying to sabotage me. Right. The intention was trying to keep my fullness. But but I, th I think that th when I competed in the Olympia in '95, Dave, I know it's one show, and a lot of people say, "Well, you were young and you should have kept going." But you know, there's a lot. It's not just a show, is it? It's the, there's a lot. There's a lot goes into that. Oh yeah, I I think you know back then people don't realize the Euro European bodybuilders with the aside maybe of Dorian, the exception of Dorian, they didn't do well, right? It, it would take you guys a couple of years of kind of continuously competing before people are kind of accepted. Oh, yeah. we know who this guy is now. Now it's okay to replace him. That exactly. seemed to be what was exactly. going on back then. And it's very frustrating. And I was young. I mean, I, I, I was, you know, I retired at 28. So when I'm coming in, I'm in, my, I'm like 24, 25, 26. So you know, mentally, I'm still, I'm still full of it. Yeah. And uh, I, I just found it very hard to accept the placings I were getting. And then, then it, it was, it wasn't just about uh, screaming about my placings. I couldn't justify to my wife right. the effort, the risks, money, money. Uh, you know, I, I'm not earning money out of this now. I, I own a gym. I'm running a gym. I'm living in the gym. Um, <laughs> and it, so it's, you know, it, you've got to justify it. I, I think, what, I, honestly, I think what happened to me, I got civilized. <laughs> can't I, do you that. Know, yeah, you can't I got that. civilized. <laughs> I, I, I fell in love. I got married. I, yeah. I had a child. And suddenly, m I wasn't the priority. Right. When I woke up, bodybuilding wasn't the first thing, and when I went to sleep, it wasn't the last thing. And I think that's really that, along with all the other things with politics, is why I just walk, I decided to walk away. Yeah. But the thing is, I've always loved bodybuilding. Deep down, I'm still a bodybuilder. Sure. I love it. I just love the sport. <laughs> what? What? Talk to me a little bit about the wrestling career you went into. Was that that right after you left bodybuilding? Yeah, basically. I mean, I, I stopped uh, competing in '98, so I'm there. At, 330 pounds, wondering what the hell am I going to do with this now? Yeah. Um, I, I knew a few wrestlers, so they said, you know, why don't you wrestle? Um, what got me into bodybuilding in the first place was judo. I did judo from the age of six, uh, six or seven. My father was a black belt in judo. 
Um, so I did that from a young age, and that got me into the lifting. Right. Uh, so I knew I could take a fall. I knew I could do all that. I'd done a little bit of acting. I'd done some Sega commercials uh, to open my first gym, and I got nice. like 20 grand for that. That's how oh, nice. I got the money to open my first gym. Uh, so I'd done a bit of acting. I'd, I, I could take a fall, so I thought, why? I, I looked the part, so I thought, well, why not wrestle? So I went into that, and I gave myself a time span on it. I gave myself like a four-year time span. Right. I wrestled in England and Ireland uh, for virtually no money, oh. meeting some great guys for about two years. And then when we eventually got our uh, green card, uh, our, uh, our, our visa to come over here and, and live in the States in 2001 right. when my son was six months old, I continued to wrestle. Um, I actually did a couple of dark matches for uh, WWE. Mm -hmm. I, I know I know Fit Finley and I know uh, I knew William Regal and a few of those guys who knew the guys I knew. Right. And then um, I wrestled for a company here in Florida, actually, with Jimmy Hart, um, oh, the okay. Nasty Boys and um, Hulk Hogan, um, all those guys. And it was based right here in Clearwater, near Clearwater, Rocky Point. Um, and I wrestled for about two and a half years with those. And they would pay me more money than I got out of bodybuilding. Um, and uh, I, I got to travel and I've got to, you know, it was a great experience. But then one year, uh, the year, uh, Road Warrior, Matt Hawk, Hawk and Animal, yeah. the year he died, he was like one of my best friends. Oh. Um, I was real close with Mike. And uh, when he died, I just decided to call it a day. I think I'd been to like nine funerals that year. Oh, and, really? Uh, I'd wow. Been, I'd been to several funerals through the bodybuilding, you know, from Deretics and stuff back in England. And I was just like, you know, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Time out. I need, I need to be normal for a while. <laughs> were you making money when you were wrestling here in the U.S.? Yes, I was. Yeah. I, I mean, not big money, but I was making. I was. I, they were paying me like a, a grand a week. Oh, that's that's pretty just good. Just to yeah. practice, and then they paid me. Uh, they paid me for the matches. Um, and then it, the, there was a few changes in in that industry, and like I say, all the deaths, and I'm just like, you know. No did you, ever, did you ever have the opportunity to try out or, or do anything with the WWE? Yes, I did. I try actually. When we lived in California, when we first moved here, uh, Fit Finley called me one day to go to the Staples Center. So I went up to the Staples Center. I had a dark match. Um, the guy I wrestled with is dead. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> the, guy, yeah. uh, the guy I did the dark match in England for WCW is also dead, Jerry. Um, he was just... Crazy, everybody I've got to know and uh, get friends with ended up dying. And I thought, maybe it was a curse for me, so I figured I'd better get out, you know? Yeah, no, I guess you, you, you escaped a couple times uh, death, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually wrestled for t uh, TN is it TNA. Yeah, TNA. I wrestled for TNA when oh, they first did? started. I did a live thing for TNA with Ken Shamrock and uh, a few other guys over there. So I met some interesting characters. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I know you a couple of those guys. They're, they're definitely uh, interesting. They're, they're fun to hang out with, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We wrestled in Puerto Rico nearly every month, and uh, I know Bushwhacker Luke really well. Oh, so really? we used to go to Puerto Rico and wrestle there all the time, and uh, that's quite a place. That's quite a place. <laughs> <laughs> so once you stopped the wrestling, you know, what did you do? You know, you have to say to yourself, okay, now I got to kind of recreate myself again. What, what did you start doing? Are you training people? What? Uh, I was, uh, no, I wasn't. I'd not been in a gym for years, actually. I'd not had nothing to do with a gym. So um, I actually got into real estate, believe it or not. Oh, really? Uh, oh, that's cool. Started uh, buying property. Probably the worst possible time you could possibly buy property. Oh, no. A bit like my bodybuilding career, really. I, I probably picked the worst time in history. <laughs> it's all about timing, right, Ian? That's uh, what I always say. Absolutely, absolutely. So <laughs> I, um, yeah, I got into real estate, and I ended up with like 13 rental properties, and I was doing all the repairs myself, collecting the rents and all that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that big crash happened, and right. uh, basically I went through a few, few nightmare years, uh, reinvented myself, and then... I opened my, a gym here in Bradenton. Uh, that was about 11, 12 years ago called City Fitness. Um, I sold that uh, just this last April uh, to concentrate on my new business. Okay, you know, now is owning a gym all well, it's cracked up to me? Because I, I always say if you're not at the gym and you're not giving 100% of yourself to the gym, it's doomed to fail. Obviously you love being in that environment. Um, was it a successful business for you? I think with me, it's successful as long as I've got um, enthusiasm for it. And uh, I, have, I have a 
I have a lifespan on most things I do. <laughs> you know, so you get bored. I, I, I'm enthusiastic about it, and I really enjoy working with people and, and helping them and training them and helping them with the diet and prepping them for shows. Huh. But after about five or six years, it gets old. Uh, so then I just decided I needed a change, to be honest with you. Right, 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 right. Well, it seemed like you've had a very uh, interesting career. You've switched gears about five or six times throughout your career. Um, any regrets? If you had to go back and do it again, I wish I had the knowledge I had now then. But no, I don't have any regrets, honestly. Okay. I, 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 when I was bodybuilding, Dave, I gave it everything. Yeah. I gave it everything I had, and um, I couldn't give it give it any more. And I honestly believe that if I'd have carried on, I may not be here today. Yeah. So. Fun What's the funniest story you can remember back in your bodybuilding days at a show or not at a show? Funniest thing that ever happened to you? Or you've seen backstage at a show or something like that? <laughs> On the, in 1995, we were doing the uh, Grand Prix tour after the Olympia. Um, and we did the Spanish Grand Prix. Uh -huh. Then we did the German Grand Prix. Then we did the English Grand Prix. And um, I met Paul DeMeo. I got, got to know Paul DeMeo quite well. And we hit it off very well. We got on really, really well. And we were just always having a laugh. And um, at the Spanish Grand Prix, I think, uh, me and Paul were on our diets, you know. And I think I placed eighth at that show. And I looked really good. And a yeah. lot of the other guys weren't in shape, but because of who they were, you know, the, the place where they did. So after that show, we all got invited out for a meal with Rafael Santonia. Right. And um, everybody went out for the meal except me and Paul DeMeo. We basically <laughs> went, you know what? We're done. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're done. So we threw all our diet food out, literally out of the window of the hotel, started drinking Gatorade and eating chocolate. We didn't care anymore. <laughs> so we got we got on the, the coach the following morning um, to go to Germany uh, to compete in Stuttgart, I believe. Right. We, 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 fl we fly to Germany, we get there. That's actually when f me and Nasser actually picked Flex up. That's when he collapsed and he got took into hospital uh, from the airport. We carried him into the cab. Oh, really? Uh, that's when he started <laughs> with his kidney issues. Uh, but wow. we go to the show and a lot of other guys join the tour. And one of them was a guy called Patrick Nichols from England. Sure. Um, good bodybuilder, a bit older than me. Um, and he was backstage and he had an ox oxygen tank. And everybody was just laughing at him. Like Charles Claremont, NASA, <laughs> all the Mayo, they were all coming in. And like, who's this guy? Yeah, they were all just laughing. It was, it was, it was quite funny. But the, where where I'm from in England, I'm from Northern England, right? And Patrick Nichols is from down south, from the uh, Muscle Works, London. So there was a bit of rivalry from what part of England you're from, right? Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, we're, we're lining up to go on stage backstage at this show in Germany, and we have, we're like we're walking upstairs. And I'm like number three in line, and Paul DeMeo's like number 10, and Patrick Nichols is right in front of him. So Paul DeMeo told me this afterwards. He taps on Patrick Nichols' shoulder, and he says, you see that? And he points to me. He says, what? He said, the back of Ian Harrison. He said, yeah, what about it? He says, you better get used to seeing that, because that's where you're going to be placing for the rest of the Grand Prix tour. <laughs> <laughs> that was Paul DeMeo's. That's just the way he was. He was funny as Because hell. he knew that he knew of that rivalry you guys had going because of where you were yes. from in England. Absolutely. There was a lot of rivalries. Yeah. You know, a lot of that's rivalries funny. back then. But yeah, Paul, Paul DeMeo, we, we got on like a house on fire. It was uh, that Grand Prix tour. There's lots of stories actually from that Grand Prix tour, to be honest with you. <laughs> how come Nasser was always having problems with everyone at all these Grand Prix? I've heard so many Nasser stories about him, you know, getting taking things so seriously, and, and, and he was always putting people down. And what what was wrong with Nasser? What do, what do you think mentally was wrong with him? You know what? Nasser was always cool with me. Me and Nasser always got on very well. That's because um, he beat you. That's the only reason he got along with you. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it, it's it's very bodybuilding attracts different personalities yeah you know, a lot of different personalities right and back then i guess it's hard not to take things personally and i, I think maybe when it because he was from yugoslavia and there's a, a bit of a language barrier there maybe they feel more isolated when they're in the states too so they feel they feel the, the need to kind of um defend verbally defend themselves all the time i don't uh. know i know the last time i contacted nasa um before he passed away was probably about 
oh, right as I opened my gym uh -huh. uh, here in Bradenton, and I emailed him and got in touch with him, and it was the response was a very I could tell he was bitter. Right. I could tell he wasn't the same man that I knew. He was very. Um, I think he'd got divorced by then. He wasn't very happy with American women, and he's. I, I just reached out to say hi, and I got a whole thing about American women and how they were. But uh, Ian, you but, don't but understand. You don't like understand asked, these women. They they do not. They don't know how to serve you, and they will not uh, take orders from you. I don't understand it. It's in my country. They uh, they, they they will do anything you ask of them, and uh, I think I am in the I wrong place. Like I. They, they, they take all my money and I have nothing left and I have to go back to work and right that, that, that's massive yeah yeah some characters back there they really yeah. like. I remember we had David Darth um, I remember competing with David Darth in uh, San Jose Pro we had a laugh then he's fun um, too yeah he's a fun the, guy there was there was a pro back there. Dave Fisher remember Dave Fisher yeah I remember Dave very well yeah he he, he competed in that show too um yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I've got a lot of good experiences competing with a lot of great bodybuilders. Um, and I have no, I know I don't have any regrets. Who, I have no regrets whatsoever. Who, who are your top five favorite bodybuilders of all time? Who do you think are the best bodybuilders of all time in your physique-wise? Flex Wheeler, Lee Haney. Um, Five, best five of all time. Is it history. best physiques that you like? Like that's a physique that you say, man, that's a great physique, you know? Charles Claremont. Really? Okay. Charles Claremont's got to be up there for me. He, from the front, Charles Claremont is pretty unbeatable. Yeah, he was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. He, he, um, Dorian. I respected Dorian's physique, but that's not what I want it to look like. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? I, I respect what he did because he's definitely set new standards in bodybuilding. Sure. Um, but that's not what I want it to look like. But you've got to put him up there. Um, what did you think of what did you, being a bigger guy? What did you think of Paul Delette's physique? I was never a big fan of Paul Delette's physique. Mm -hmm. In all honesty, he was massive, and I knew him quite well. He was a he was a funny guy, um, but I was never a fan of his. We always used to make fun of his posing yeah he was the um, worst poser of all time yeah yeah but um he had a freaky genetics and a freaky natural frame but when he posed it didn't come to life to yeah. me you know it's like uh, you look like a samir banu when he won the olympia i mean not a massive guy but as soon as he hit pose it's like wow where did that come from right that's what bodybuilding to me should be you know the but the guy walks out on stage and they look impressive but then when they hit a pose Things happen, right? And I think a lot of the guys with the bigger guys, the thicker, chunkier guys, they look great when they stand, but then when they actually hit a pose, not a lot happens. It just kind of moves. Sure. And they're just different types of physique, you know. I guess I guess I always had to admire Arnold because I think he got everybody into it. Right. You know, you, you look at Arnold's physique, uh, and then when you look at Ronnie Coleman, I mean, what he achieved. It, I, I wish I could have seen some of those shows in mm. person rather than just look at pictures, to be honest. I wish I'd have still been involved and, and been able to see it because some of the black and white pictures I've seen of him just look absolutely yeah. insane. He was wacky. He was wacky. Yeah. Well, Ian, I want to thank you for taking time and uh, talking to us. Uh, you know, I like to go back. All the fans love to hear about the, the 90s and what went on during that time frame. And, you know, you, you did make an impact during that short period of time that you, that you were a pro. And uh, for Thank your own you. reasons, obviously, you got out when you got out. And uh, I'm glad that you're here to talk to us today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And that's going to take us to the end of another episode of Live With, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit speciesnutrition.com. I'm Dave Palumbo. We'll see you next time.